to say, let's at least talk about the value of Christianity for today. For I look at these universities, the most illustrious universities of the West, and you've all shared with me images of young women draped in kefirs, the symbol of Hamas, performing the Muslim prayer. And tell me if those kids are not morally and utterly lost. And queers for Palestine. So while you and I and Steven Pinke and all of those wonderful people were locked up in our ivory towers, let's ask ourselves what was happening on the ground. Because in the last six decades, we pretty much demonized Christianity and the teachings of Christianity out of the public space, out of school, out of universities. Mm -hmm. And a vacuum occurred, and that vacuum is now being filled, as G.K. Chesterton said, not because people have come to reason, but because now they'll believe in anything. There are very awful forces today out there that are claiming the hearts and minds and souls of these young students. So and when you say there is nothing, you offer them nothing. We're getting into the bigger political, yeah. cultural question. I just feel it's worth pressing one more time on this. What you said agree to disagree. And yeah. I understand, having read Richard's letters to you, that that literal belief is the bit that he can't get past. Are you saying that you don't literally believe those things. You talked about planes of reality. Is it that you see a beauty in those things and choose to suspend your rational judgment? Or yeah. do you literally believe them? Yeah, I mean, I think there is something subjective and there's a choice. There are things that you see and perceive that a different person cannot perceive. Um, art, music. In fact, I think you do enjoy a great deal of Christian art and music. Um, I will look at a painting by Pollack, and I will think my six-year-old must have spilled all the paint on the canvas and run around. And people are crazy enough to pay millions of dollars and hang it on walls. But I've actually seen people be moved to tears staring at a Pollack. That is a plane of perception that is real, but that's also very, very difficult to measure. And it's the same the way you're moved by certain pieces of music. So the fact that I have faith and I choose to have faith because of what I've experienced uh, is just as real for me as it is for the millions of people who believe. Um, but for me, what is even more real is it's, it's the story itself and the, the wisdom in that story. The, the morality that has come out, that has evolved out of that story, the internal debates of millennia long and everything that we inherited from it, it's just too casual to cast that aside. And when we've done it, I think we have caused ourselves a great deal of damage. Richard, having heard that story, that moving story from Ayan of clearly how her conversion has helped her and also she's explained in beautiful words the, the mode in which she believes it, do you still say you are not a Christian? No, not at all. I, I, I came here prepared to persuade you, Ayan, you're not a Christian. I think you are a Christian, yeah. and I think Christianity is nonsense. Um, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> you, you, you have to be, I mean, you, you, are, you, you appear to be a theist. You appear mm -hmm. to believe in, in some kind of higher power. Now, I think that the th hypothesis of theism is the most exciting scientific hypothesis that you could possibly hold. And the idea that the universe was actually created by a supernatural intelligence is a dramatic, important idea. If it were true, it would completely change everything we know. We'd be living in a totally different, different universe. Now, that's a big thing. It's, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's bigger than personal comfort and nice stories and things. The idea that the universe has lurking beneath it an intelligence, a supernatural intelligence that invented the laws of physics, that invented mathematics, and that is a stupendous idea, if it's true. And to me, that simply dwarfs all talk of nobility and morality and 
um, and comfort and that sort of thing. So would you have preferred for your erstwhile new atheist colleague, Ian, not to have converted? Having heard her story, would you rather...? No, I, no, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. Um, I'm just saying that, that, it, that religious belief is bigger than, than what gives you comfort. Or it's bigger than morality, it's bigger than what gives you, gives you comfort, it's bigger than, than what gives you a bulwark against Islam. It's something huge, it's something terrific. And it's false. Are you not moved at all to, she mentioned, planes of reality? Um, is it for you entirely black and white, whether those kind of stories are true or not? It feels like Ayan is saying that she <coughs> chooses to believe them because she accesses a, some kind of greater truth via them and is less interested in the details. Do you, you're not softened at all on that? I, well, I'm softened by a personal story and, and I'm softened by beautiful music. I mean, I've, I've, you know, I'm softened by um, St. Matthew Passion, and not, not, not just the, the music itself, but the story behind it. It's a, it's, a, it's a very moving story. And I'm moved by it in the same way as I'm moved by great fiction. It is, it is fiction. And, and one, of course, can be moved by fiction. I think Ayan has described me as, as the most Christian person she knows. And, and, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that may be true in certain senses, in a, in a cultural sense. Um, and uh, I certainly, when you when you say, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when you say Christianity is a religion of love, um, Jesus, I think, was a very, very great character, a, a, a very loving character. The, the the bad things about Christianity actually stem mostly from what came afterwards, St. Paul um, and, the, and the other well, Chris, Christian apologists who came up after him. Um, so you, you cannot allow the possibility that Ian has accessed a truth that you yourself have not seen? It is a scientific hypothesis that there is a supernatural creator. And... Um, I don't see how you can get to that from uh, feelings of personal comfort or feelings of political um, mm -hmm. necessity. Uh, you have to get to that from, from thinking. And that brings us to consciousness. So first of all, the hypothesis itself, um, <coughs> which even if you don't allow for set religion aside, the hypothesis of where did all this come from and how did it begin, again, there is um, <coughs> no consensus on that. Um, there is no consensus on what consciousness is and um, what all that entails. Um, but I think that it is, on an academic level, very interesting and very rewarding um, to look into and explore all of these different things separately um, on an academic level, on a non-academic level. I think that it's very useful now, I hate to go back to utility, but to have all of these things connected where as human beings uh, we are material, yes, but we also are more than material. We have a sense of consciousness and we have a range of needs. And some of these needs, um, reason can answer and pure science can answer. But some of these needs cannot be answered by that. And I think faith in a higher power, in God, and in the story that makes sense of it all, gives it meaning is very, very important for human beings. And the danger lies in trying to conflate these different planes um, and then casting aside as useful. It is false, it's useful, it's useless, it's unnecessary. And now we have you know, the, the range of human suffering where as an atheist, um, you don't really offer um, an answer, you don't offer, 
a prescription for this is um, this is a way of life. This is a path to happiness. This is how you can deal with the challenges of existence. And athe atheism is an attitude. It basically says, uh, as of now, there is no evidence to show that God exists or that a higher power exists, full stop. And you figure the rest of it out. And it's very, very difficult to mm. figure the rest of it out, starting from scratch. And I think faith then gives meaning and purpose. And yes, if you're afraid of the dark, and if you're afraid of whatever it is that's causing you anxiety, or whatever is causing you um, self-doubt, um, relationships between other human beings, I think Christianity does offer a recipe, mm. and perhaps in my view, the best recipe for not only how to live with yourself and connect to the universe, but also how to connect with fellow human beings and, and, and then bring about a civilization like this one. Suppose it were true that atheism doesn't offer anything. Suppose it doesn't offer anything. So what? Why should it offer anything? Why should the universe offer you anything? But what is the scientific explanation for you being moved to tears by Sir Matthew's passion? Well, it's neurology. Um, let me ask that. I, um... I think the question you ask now is very interesting. Why should atheism offer you anything? There is no reason why atheism should offer anything but something else. Faith offers something, something valuable and tangible and great. Yes, I... So why should atheism mock that and knock it down? No, it, is I it don't not want to possible mock it. to have this coexistence where there is a place for reason and there is a place for faith and for subjectivity? Just like we agree to have a separation between religion and politics, I think it is absolutely possible to have, and Christianity allows for that, a separation of science and uh, you know, the material world, the temporal world, versus the world of faith. And these things, when, when they complement each other, uh, I, I think lead to a much more powerful outcome than when you, I, again, I find, I find the differences between us a little cosmetic and a little artificial because there are so many things I agree with that you are saying. It's just that the, um, the attitude that atheists take, that if you do not see the world the way they see it, and if you don't live according to reason, you must be an idiot. You must be unintelligent. You must be no, stupid. No, 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 no. I think no, that that no, is a bit that no. um, just smacks of... Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, let, let, let's not let's not go there. I I, I don't want to say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I do want to say is this: um, faith offers you something. Obviously, that's very 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 clear. But it doesn't make it true. It doesn't make the existence claims of Christianity true. Um, there there is a difference from saying that that um, being in a certain psychological place is consoling and comforting and offers you a meaning, for li a meaning of life and, and gives you a purpose in life, all those things which, which are wonderful. And I have them too. They're, they're a bit different, but I too have a purpose in life. I have a meaning in, in, in life. But just simply because something gives you a meaning and a purpose in life, it doesn't make the ex existential claims true. And Christianity, like any other religion, makes claims about the world, about the universe, which are either true or not true. And I may be wrong and you may be, may be right, they may, they may be true, but the mere fact that they're comforting doesn't make them true. That's a, an important point. But I agree with you on that point. The mere fact that they are comforting doesn't make them, through, make them true, um, but the hypothesis that um, there's something rather than nothing is something you can't disprove as much as I can't prove uh, materially that yes. Jesus was born out of a virgin. So yes. I think it's some of these areas where I think um, 
it, it's a very, very important debate that occurred about 200 I agree. years ago. We, we can have that debate, and, and yes. that's, that's an important debate, and, and, and that's the one I would like to have, um, rather than the one that, that's comforting. I mean, um, for example, uh, I would like to know whether you think that we survive our bodily death when our, when our brain dies. I, I, mean, when I, I asked you that when we had dinner together, and you said no. Have you changed your mind about that? I'm sorry, please repeat. What have I changed okay. my mind about? About life after death, about, about surviving. Do we survive our bodily I, existence? I, I said, do you think we, 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 we survive our own death? And you said no. I said yes. Bodily, no. I, do not, I, I don't survive death. I don't no. think you will survive death. I said that when Bertrand Russell said, when we die, we shall rot, that, yes. uh, that is true. But then what happens to the soul, consciousness, etc.? That, again, I don't know. I so can't. you think there is a soul that, that, that survives death? Well, there is something that, um, again, like I said, I, I, I did feel a connection, and that wasn't, it, it wasn't a bodily connection. It was a connection with, through consciousness and mind. And if that's going to outlast me or not, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know about that. But Richard, I do know where you stand on this debate, mm. and so that is. The <laughs> we we could spend the next okay, half okay, hour okay. going through yes. different theological okay. points and seeing whether Ian agrees with them or not. But there is this bigger cultural, societal impact point that yes. you've really been in the middle of, Richard. You you came out as a cultural Christian. Uh, or well, at least I didn't. I mean, I've been a cultural Christian all along, and I've never said anything else. I, 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 um... there, was a, uh, there was a lot of social media excitement recently that you had decided, yeah. or you had confirmed that you were a cultural Christian. This, and this is, I suppose, the political Christianity point that Ian has also been making. If you accept that there is utility to faith at an individual level and at a societal level, how do you feel about what you have done and your fellow new atheists for the past few decades in so enthusiastically dismantling it? Uh, I am so much more wedded to the importance of truth that, that I, I don't regret anything. Yeah. Um, I, I, do, I, do, I do think that um, if, for example, in Africa, uh, there are missionaries, Christian missionaries and um, Muslim missionaries fighting for people's loyalty. And I'm on Team Christianity where that's concerned. Um, <laughs> and so politically, uh, it, um, if, you, if you have to have a, a religion... Um, I, Will you I explain, think, explain that to us a little bit more? If you, if you have to is... have... A, if you have to, I don't believe you have to have a religion. I think it's patronising to suggest that people do need a religion. But if they do need a religion, then I'd rather it was Christianity than anything else. So the, the dream world, according to Dawkins, would be nobody having a religion, and yes. then in second place, Christianity, and then yes. Islam comes last. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. You said, you, she, I, I think that's fantastic. And I also want to say, you, <laughs> you don't have to go as far as Africa to see this confrontation between Team Christianity and Team Islam and uh, Team Christianity versus Team Wokeism. It's right here. There is a great deal of Islamic missionary work that has been very successful in Britain and in the, U in the US and in other parts of Europe. And I think Team Christianity or Team Christian um, is... Uh, is less confident uh, here in the world of Christian civilization than, say, in Africa. And I want to go one step further and call upon Team Christianity uh, to counter this message because it's, it's, it's a very powerful message. And even if you and I disagree on whether, you know, there is God and whether there's creation, I respect your view, I know you respect mine. But 
Are you inviting Richard Dawkins to join Team Christianity? Richard Dawkins is on Team Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> Do you accept that, Richard Dawkins? Are you on Team Christianity? But uh, is it Richard a Dawkins? choice? <laughs> <laughs> Richard Dawkins just said that, but I think, and, and I really mean this in a serious way, I look at those young people uh, in their 20s, uh, in their teens, in their 30s, and right now they're being offered these messages of moral frameworks that they're embracing that are cultish, that are based on fear, that are nihilistic, and that are dead end. And so if you say you're on Team Christianity, then I would encourage those who are so inclined as to uh, advance Christianity, not to worry about Africa, but to start it here. <laughs> Stand up to those people yes, in Colombia and what's Harvard the, and Penn U. problem? What, 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 what are you against he, he, here? That, that the, the, the young people have been susceptible to other uh, ideologies. That yes, are but what far other inferior. ideologies are what are we speaking of there? Uh, well, there are mosques and Islamic centers that have convinced young people here in America um, and in Britain and elsewhere that Christianity is, um, is dead, has nothing to offer, um, that Western civilization is a moral vacuum, and that they're here to fill it. And to my astonishment, it seems as if they're making an impact. Look at all these so-called pro-Palestine protests, which are not really pro-Palestine. These are, in my view, clearly, um, uh, in many ways, you know, they're adopting um, the religious frameworks of, uh, offered by Islamists. And, uh, and what I see is not what you saw in the 1960s, that's a different story. What you're seeing now is a moral vacuum that is being filled, a moral vacuum left behind, left, you know, untended by And, uh, and what is your answer to that? Your, are you hoping for some kind of Christian revival then? Are you now the, having been a famous new atheist, would you now be a Christian evangelist? <laughs> I think... I don't know if you should put it that way. The way I would like to put it is you have this amazing civilization, you have these amazing societies, and um, it is pretty frightening to see that the best and the brightest are converting to the mind virus of wokeism and the mind virus of Islamism, and that as atheists, um, uh, it, no one even seems to have woken up to the idea. There is a condemnation of wokeism, which you do. Which you condemn the woke and the mind virus of the woke. You condemn radical Islam. But I think, what do we then have to offer to these young people who are seeking something? Rational, secular humanism. <laughs> Enlightenment. Enlightenment values. <clears throat> So, so do you share Ayan's diagnosis the, of the mind virus of wokeism, as she puts it, of uh, Islamism's yes. <coughs> return to yes. parts of the West? And, and enlightenment humanism doesn't seem to have resisted that advance very successfully. Well, let's press it harder then. <laughs> Rational, secular humanism is itself an outcome of Christianity. And well, <clears throat> I think I don't buy that. Uh, um, it's, it starts with the admission that rational, secular humanism, um, <clears throat> the Enlightenment, was able to take place within that Christian context, and it is a product of Christian civilization. It didn't happen in China. It didn't happen in the Middle East. It didn't happen anywhere else. It happened in these dis disputes between Christians. And I think part of that story and that whole history is one that needs to be celebrated and told and given to these young minds. And I think where, where, you, where you have a vacuum 
something is going to fill it. And uh, aside from the personal uh, rewards that I reap from Christianity, and that you reap from Christianity, I think there is the societal and the civilizational context where this thing is going through the cracks and without a counter message, a spiritual counter message, I think we're in uh, very, very bad and very, very serious it, it trouble. It may be true historically that uh, rational secular humanism grew out of Christianity in the sense that historically that's where it came from. But you could say it's a reaction against Christianity rather than having um, been in concert with, with Christianity. But even, even as a reaction against Christianity, the things that, the advances that we have made are rooted in that story. And my objection to throwing the baby out with the bathwater is that if you create this disconnect so that young people do not, they don't, they haven't been told of those debates, they're reading works that tell them that everything that the white male Christian left behind is exploitative, it's destructive, it has to be replaced with something else, it's settler colonial, whatever. It's being cut off from the roots of that civilization. And I think part of the reason why that vacuum came about and it was possible was because of this casting aside of Christianity and this attitude within atheism that if you say reason, everybody will suddenly start becoming you know, reasonable and think reasonably. And in that sense, that's been a mistake. G.K. Chesterton was right. But do you... Yeah. Do you regret yeah. having been part of the new atheism movement, having preached atheism from that pulpit? Um, I do regret doing that. And I, and I want to say that um, when I realized the damage that I was doing, and I was doing a great deal of damage by equating Islam with Christianity. First of all, it is false. We were talking about truth and falsehood, and not all religions are the same. Religions are different because they, are, they come out of different cultures and grow out of uh, different contexts. So Christianity is not the same as Islam, and I'm guilty of having said, well, all faiths, all perceptions of God are the same and they're equally damaging. Um, so I come back from that and I also have come to regret um, the damage that I've done and I want to see, I want to make my friends like Richard and Sam Harris and uh, Daniel Dennett and all the others, um, I, I, I want you to see uh, what I see and what I see is where you have a moral vacuum, something is going to fill it. I want you to see that the teachings of Christianity, just like you said, if there is a competition between Team Christian and Team Islam, you would be on Team Christian, that what you value in Christianity is something that really is absolutely necessary to pass on to the next generation. And we have failed the next generation by taking away from them that moral framework and telling them it's nonsense and false, but also not protecting them then from the external forces that come in for their hearts, their minds, and their souls. I think you're wrong to say. In este intenso debate, Ayan Hirsi Ali y Richard Dawkins exploran las complejidades de la fe y el secularismo. Hirsi Ali reconoce su arrepentimiento por haber predicado el ateísmo, ya que el vacío moral que generó ha sido llenado por ideologías radicales que dañan las mentes y corazones de las personas. Este vacío ha permitido que fuerzas externas manipulen a los jóvenes, alejándolos de un marco moral sólido. Hirsi Ali subraya la importancia del cristianismo, no solo como un conjunto de creencias, sino como un pilar fundamental para el desarrollo de la sociedad en todos sus aspectos. Las enseñanzas cristianas son esenciales para transmitir valores a las nuevas generaciones y protegerlas de influencias destructivas.